Thank you for attending today's session. My name is Dr. John White. Uh, and I will be serving as your moderator for this session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce spe speakers for this session. Uh, Dr. Dr. Thomas Blackman. Sullivan, Dr. Michael Blackman, and Alan Smith are presenting on behalf of the principal investigator, Dr. Grant Caro, down here in the front row, uh, his grant work. Uh, they will also be providing a demo of their system for electronic prescribing for controlled substances. This grant has required close collaboration between ARC and the DEA. Uh, I did not believe in the black helicopters until they came to talk, uh, but they are there. Uh, and I, I will... Uh, I, there are very few projects for which I actually serve as the project officer, and usually I'm kind of floating up in great big giant headland. Uh, uh, but this is one for which I did serve as the project officer just because of that uh, close working relationship with the DEA that was required. Um, and I am pleased to say that uh, this project uh, sent the first legal e-prescription for controlled substances uh, in the country, which is kind of an Alexander Graham Bell moment, and they will tell you about that. So as we look to improve e-prescribing for end users to test to make sure it was safe, the DEA for years had always been concerned about diversion. Um, the, that's the DEA's job, frankly, and it's an important one. Uh, patient care is not what they do. Patient care is what we do. And so it was how do you sort of balance those two issues? And the DEA believed they knew what diversion looked like on paper, um, but diversion electronically was really an unknown thing. So the DEA had a whole bunch of things they were putting out and want to see how people would respond. So we wanted to make sure that what we did in terms of pres providing controlled substance e-prescribing was easy to use, that it dealt with some of the law enforcement and regulatory issues, not the least of which is, you know, non-repudiation, prove that, you know, I can't write the prescription and then come back and say, well, I didn't do it, somebody else did it. Um, the DEA could actually use this data for law enforcement and other uses. And then is there a real difference between a Schedule II drug and, and anything from Schedules three through five? Um, because even on paper, the rules for prescribing those are different. Um, Schedule twos had to be handwritten, had to have a wet signature on them, whereas the others could actually be faxed. So obviously, controlled medication prescribing is all covered by the Controlled Substances Act uh, and controlled by and enforced by the DEA. So what we needed for this project was a memorandum of agreement with the DEA that allowed us to, frankly, have an exception from federal law. We came to this agreement with them in the fall of 2008, which was just after the notice of proposed rulemaking came out. So we were able to incorporate some of the features from the proposed rules to try to test some of them. One key note, however, about this project, the pro both the proposed rules and the interim final rule both have a number of provisions surrounding what pharmacies must do. This project specifically did not include the pharmacy end. We used something else, which we'll talk about when we get to the demo, about how we controlled the pharmacy piece, but we did not change the pharmacy systems to allow digital signing at pharmacy, uh, figuring that was going to take far too long and be too involved. So that's really a separate piece from this. So what's happened as we've gone through this? One of the biggest concerns early on that people voiced was the two-factor, the authentication that was going to be required for practitioners, you know, both a PIN and something you have. In our case, we used a crypto key. It's about the size of a, you know, a, a flash drive. It needs to be in the computer at the same time you're putting in your PIN. People would say, well, that's going to be a big deal. Interestingly enough, it wasn't. We had exactly zero complaints from physicians about using the secondary factor authentication. And certainly as we look to the future, there are going to be other options for that, whether that be a biometric device, the device you're actually using. But for our project, the DA required that it be a separate physical device, but again, a non-issue, um, which was really nice to see. So, but if you think about, just a second, what the flow is different between conventional e-prescribing and controlled substance e-prescribing. So in conventional e-prescribing, you simply write it. It goes from the prescriber to the e-prescribing system to a network and then to a pharmacy. The additional pieces are one, first of all, identification of the prescriber up front. Um, one of the pieces that people have read in the final rule and how we're going to do that on a grand scale to really do the, the identity proofing there. Second uh, is the token itself, the, the extra piece. And if you think about it, it's almost three-factor authentication because there's a password to log into the system. And then at the time you're actually prescribing, you have both a signature pin and the key. So you actually need to know three pieces. At the, in our process, it then goes through the e-prescribing vendor to the network, and then there it checks in real time against the DEA database. 
to make sure that the person actually has a DEA number that's valid. So that gets updated, I believe, on a daily basis. So if somebody was in the system or gets taken out today, their keys won't work tomorrow. Um, the it gets digitally signed and then it gets sent over to the pharmacy. The last piece in the lower right-hand corner is that digital signature and archiving at the pharmacy level that we did not do. However, what the pharmacies do get is a secondary piece. So they get the prescription electronically and they get a confirmation fax. Um, and they basically match those two pieces up to make sure it's a valid prescription. If they don't have both pieces, it's not a valid prescription. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a regular prescription for amoxicillin. And this is going to be a live prescription, a real prescription. It's going to be transmitted to a pharmacy in Massachusetts. And we're going to have the pharmacist call in and be on the phone so that we can validate that he got the prescription as well as the fax validation uh, that uh, Michael just mentioned. I'm going to say this guy has a lot of pain, so I think I'll uh, write for morphine. So up comes the list, and you see here there's a little, little uh, notice. These are Schedule II drugs. Uh, and I'm going to pick uh, 30 milligrams of morphine. And uh, now I did write for this before, and you see the sticky features. The SIG is already filled. In addition to that, again, it shows the pharmacy here. Uh, and a reminder that it's Schedule II. Uh, here I have no option to refill it because we know they cannot be refilled by law. You have to write a new prescription. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, looking at that and it's ready and I'm going to say two tablets by mile three times a day because that's what I've given him in the past. So I continue on and once again we get the, the image of what the prescription will look like. Now you notice it's got my DEA number on it up here in addition to my national provider uh, um, indicator. And it's got the same other things on it. So I click, it looks okay to me. And you know, in real life, you go through these much faster, much faster, especially if you renew them. That's a nice thing about this system. And now, lo and behold, we see some new uh, alerts up here. In red, we see the little reminder, signing this controlled substance prescription indicates that we've reviewed it and confirmed it, the information's accurate, and, and we have the intent to sign. Now notice down here, uh, where I wrote the prescription for amoxicillin previously, there was a default check in the box. That's another little reminder that we want you to look this over. In other words, you just can't speed through this. I have to actually check that I want to send this. And so I put in my password, which is different, and I hit send. And, oh, there's a little error there. What the heck? Oh my gosh, I forgot to insert my crypto key. This is the two-factor authentication. So how could I do that? Oh well. All right, so I'm inserting the crypto key right now. And uh, hit OK. And uh, let's see how quickly it takes. It recognizes my crypto key. Now this is again, this is a this is again two-factor authentication at work. It's what I have as well as what I know. My password is what I know. What I have is this special key that binds itself to my computer. Okay? So uh, if uh, someone has my password but they don't have my crypto key, they can't send this prescription. Uh, and I'll show you some other potential fraud scenarios. So I'm going to send this and I click send and it gives me a little indication here that both of these prescriptions were sent to this pharmacy uh, in western Massachusetts. This is real time so those those prescriptions should have gotten there by now like that. Amazing. At least I think I'm old enough to think it's amazing. <laughs> and I think we hear our pharmacist on the telephone. Uh, here's uh, this is uh, Stan Walzik, who is the owner of the O'Laughlin's Pharmacy. You, uh, Stan, are you on the line? Did you get the uh, prescription or the fax validation? Can you hear this? Good morning. I, I, do, I do hear you. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Yes, we do hear you. Okay. I've been listening to you since about 5 after 10. Oh, um, I sorry. followed your conversation where you sent the electronic prescription at 1016. I waited. The fax rang and I received the fax confirmation at 1017. I went into my 
electronic log in the uh, computer, and I have a test electronic controlled uh, substance at 1019. So it, contr it uh, made the total loop from the time that you said you sent it at 1016, the fax was received at 1017, and the actual computer uh, electronic prescription arrived at the pharmacy at 1019. I'd say that's fantastic. You know, this little, I, I don't want to be accused of a little hyperbole, but, you know, my big teaching hospital is Mass General. They have a place there called the Ether Dome, where ether anesthesia was first demonstrated publicly. You got the first demonstration publicly of, <laughs> of an electronic position, and again.